Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. everybody we welcome. are joining. We have about 40 people in person, about the same number, I think. I'm not sure, Pam, if you can see how many. Those were registered. So we had incredible interest and registration for the workshop. So really excited for that. Um, you've probably had a chance to walk around the facility. Welcome to the Mary Winspear Center. Uh, I think you'll be really impressed. Uh, this is where we're going to have one of the concurrent sessions tomorrow. Uh, there's, it's just a really beautiful facility. And I'd just like to acknowledge that we're on the land of the Wasanich peoples. And so we're very grateful uh, for this beautiful space and uh, being able to be here. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Leanne Isaac. I am the uh, small mammal and herp specialist for the province of BC. And I was just really excited when Steve, Hannah and Christina were interested in pulling together a conservation genetics workshop for everyone. And as I said, there's just been incredible interest uh, I just would like to introduce uh, the three of them. I'm just going to read from my notes here. Uh, some of you might know Hannah. Uh, Hannah recently started as a research assistant in genomics at the African Lion Safari in Cambridge, um, where her research is focused on using genetic data for ex situ conservation. And for the last year and a half, she worked as a research assistant with a Canadian biogenome project. And that's where I uh, was fortunate enough to meet Hannah. And she helped organize conservation genomics workshops for the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake and Eastern loggerhead shrike. Hannah did her master's in biology at Queen's University, standing, uh, studying plant genetics and reproductive variation. Steve uh, is a professor of biology and environmental studies, a holder of the Bailey family chair in conservation biology and director of the Queen's University Biological Station. His research is, uh, focuses on quantifying the interacting evolutionary, geological, and climatic forces that shape the evolutionary history and diversity of vertebrates, and quantifying human impacts on reptiles and amphibians that are of conservation concern, mostly using genomics and genomics tools. A recent emphasis has been on using environmental DNA to map species distributions or quantifying entire species assemblages in aquatic environments. And Christina, uh, who's at the back of the room, is an associate professor at Carleton University. Her research integrates disease ecology, behavioral ecology, and conservation genomics to inform the recovery of species at risk, uh, especially bats, amphibians, and reptiles. And she previously worked as research scientist with the government on of Ontario and served as a jurisdictional member of Kisiewik. Uh, Christina currently serves on the board of directors for CHS and is rejoining Kasiwik as a non-governmental science member next year. So just really fortunate for their time and effort uh, and stepping up and putting together this workshop that's, I think, going to be of incredible value for all the members. So this is uh, probably a good time. Think carefully about workshops that you might uh, be interested in want to see at next year's uh, CHS conference. So the schedule, uh, we are going to start off, this was sent to everybody. I'll just uh, do a high level reminder. So Christina is going to talk about, essentially just give us a primer, uh, spend some time doing that. Hannah's then going to talk about uh, genetic techniques. And then Steve's going to uh, dive a little deeper into eDNA and have some lightning talks from some of his students. We'll have a break. Uh, we'll have some snacks and drinks just at the back here in this room. And then we'll round out the day with a uh, discussion about uh, DUs. Our timing will be fluid uh, in terms of there might be some discussion points that might push us uh, over our timeline. I'll try to keep us as tight as possible, but particularly for those online, just be patient with us because it, if you're tuning in later, just note that uh, our schedule is quite fluid. We do have to end promptly at 5 p.m. So uh, just note that if you do have items that don't come up, uh, I know the three of them are going to be here this weekend. So please make a note of connecting with them at that time. All right. So thanks to everybody for being here. And um, thanks so much for 
letting me join you guys on this fun expedition, Hannah and Steve, um, and to Leanne, obviously, for coordinating, and Pam and Hannah for making it possible for folks to join online. Um, if you, for my part anyways, if you need to leave for any reason, run to the washroom or something and come on back in, please don't feel like you're trapped here. Just go and then come on back. And we'll try and make time for questions and discussion as we go so that you can let me know if anything is not clear. Okay. So my part of this workshop is going to be super light on the molecular details because Hannah and Steve are going to get more into that later. But my goal here is to make sure that everybody understands the very basic, basic principles of conservation genetics. And thank you to those of you who filled out that survey online. Um, over half of the folks in the room have identified that they know either nothing or just a little bit of basics about genetics in general. And so I'm, that's, that's who I'm talking to. So for folks like Leslie, bear with me. Um, if we just look at where we're going in this part of the workshop, we're going to talk about what conservation genetics actually is, what we're trying to achieve in conservation genetic studies. We're going to talk about why we even care about genetic diversity in conservation specifically. Um, the very basic basics of DNA, which I think will be a review for everybody, but is going to take us into the basic principles of conservation genetics so that we have sort of an umbrella idea of what we're trying to achieve. And then when Hannah talks to you about actual tools for doing these studies, you can put those into the context of set kind of our, our research goals. Um, one thing that I know is sometimes a barrier to folks for jumping into genetic studies is all of the random language that we throw into things. <laughs> and if you don't have this very bespoke vocabulary, then it's hard to keep up and it can feel very exclusive. So we are all three of us going to do our best not to use too much genetic jargon. But we also have, if you take a look on the um, table in front of you, there are some sheets of paper underneath those chocolates. You can eat the chocolates later, don't eat them yet. Um, where we've given you a very basic glossary of terms that we hope will be helpful so that everyone's on the same page. And if I end up using too much jargon in part of what I'm explaining, somebody who notices, please put your hand up and stop me. I can say it again more clearly. I promise I can do that thing. Okay, so what is conservation genetics? Why do we actually care about, for example, the diversity of these snapping turtles that Ashley Lifeso snapped a picture of ages ago? Conservation genetics is basically the application of genetics to understand and reduce the risk of population and species extinctions. So in conservation science or conservation biology, generally we're trying to reduce species extinctions. And in conservation genetics, we're trying to use the genetic tools we have to either better understand threats to the species and how they're affecting populations, or in some cases to evaluate potential interventions that we're trying to boost a population, right? To identify species distributions, all of those extra pieces of conservation work that genetic tools can help to inform. The IUCN or the International Union for the Conservation of Nature recognizes three major levels of diversity, and that includes genetic diversity within species, diversity among species, and then ecosystem diversity. And if we think about conservation genetics, we're really looking at those first two points. So this is probably a good time for me to remind you all that species are a completely human construct, and they don't really mean a definable, evidence-based, replicable thing. And that's okay. They are a useful construct, but life on Earth is constantly evolving. That's the whole point, right? And we have all of this amazing diversity out there. And sometimes we have species that we recognize that fall really nicely into these little boxes that we've created to try and understand the world. And sometimes we don't, and that's okay. That's as much as we're going to say about that. Okay. Why do we care about genetic diversity? Can you just take 30 seconds at your tables? First, please make sure that everybody knows each other's names. And then come up with two reasons why we care about genetic diversity within or among populations. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm going to pull us back just so we don't go too long here, but I understand that that was not a satisfyingly long chunk of time. Can we hear what some groups have come up with? Michaela's group. What, what did you come up with as a reason to care about genetic diversity? You said several things. So providing the genetic variation to allow adaptation when activities happen, for example. Yep. Uh, species survival plans due to the genetic background. And then less than just knowing we're losing evolutionary history in general. Yeah, so we've got sort of caring for the inherent value of genetic diversity as part of our shared evolutionary history. Targeted management requires some understanding of relationships and adaptive potential, the ability of populations to adapt as their environment changes. Did anyone else have other points? Tyler. Right. They are the population, so excessive traits that might be deleterious to um, the species? The yeah, population? preventing the accumulation of these potentially harmful genetic variants, right, that can reduce population viability. So we're really, we're really talking here about a whole host of reasons. And then when we get to conservation, our biggest reason is about conserving adaptive potential, right? That's that ability for the species to continue to successfully adapt and persist, even in the face of our rapid environmental change. And because herps are the gateway drug to bats and for Heather, this is, this is the poster child for, well, it's one of the four poster children for this whole argument. So when I started my PhD, we were making this, this argument, right? Like, well, adaptive potential is really, really important. And in 2006, this new um, fungal pathogen arrived in the Eastern United States, right? And it spread all over the place and our bats all got white nose syndrome and the bats at the sites that my group works at crashed by 95%. This one was caught last summer and it's doing great because there was a big enough population with enough adaptive potential in it that when this novel threat arrived, there were these really rare but present variants in the population that were able to tolerate the disease. So now we have about 5% of the bats we had before across all the species that were affected, but they're doing great. The problem is, that 5% now doesn't have a ton of adaptive potential left, right? They've gone through this really strong bottleneck. That's where a huge population gets pushed through a very, very dramatic population decline, and only a few individuals come through, and you lose a lot of genetic diversity in that process. So let's say we do a whole ton of genetic studies. What can we actually learn from them? We can describe species and their evolutionary relationships or history. We can have long arguments in taxonomic journals about which species are which and which ones count. We can quantify variation within species and estimate gene flow among groups. So if you imagine that each of these tables is a separate population, but sometimes there's migration among the tables for mating, that would be a case where we have gene flow among groups, and that's going to generally maintain high diversity in this meta population of all of you in the room, right? Or you could imagine a scenario where, I don't know, Hannah and Tom's table over here is isolated from the rest of the meta population. So you're all occasionally exchanging genes. I mean this in a not creepy way, by the way. You're all occasionally exchanging genes, right? But this population that's isolated is going to generally, or sorry, is going to slowly lose diversity over time and end up looking genetically quite different to the bigger population they used to be part of. So we can estimate that with genetic tools. We can also try and define DUs or at least have big arguments about DUs. We can estimate major historic changes in population size or sex ratio. We can detect species presence through eDNA surveys. So Steve's gonna tell you all about this later. We can assign confiscated poached individuals back to their place of origin. We can inform and evaluate interventions for endangered populations. Two examples, there are more, is that we can use genetics to manage our captive breeding programs, right? We can have a stud book that keeps track of who's related to who, and we can try and maintain genetic diversity in our zoo populations by avoiding matings between closely related individuals. And then we can do genetic monitoring of wild populations over time to see whether they're maintaining their diversity, which would tell us that things are going okay, 
or whether the genetic diversity in the population is dropping, which would tell us that either that the populations become isolated, like Tom and Sarah's table, or that they've had a really major decline, like in the bats. So far, so good? Okay. Did I say anything that was super unclear? Awesome. Pam, there's nothing on Zoom, right? Great. Okay. There's a lot. That's great. But there's not like a, oh my gosh, I don't get it in the chat. That's good. <laughs> Sorry, Zoom people. You are all on Zoom. I know that. Okay. So when we work in genetics, we're working with DNA and RNA, right? We're not talking about RNA today. <laughs> it's a different thing. But if we think about DNA and what it actually is, just a reminder that your genetic material is encoded on deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. We're just going to call it DNA from now on, which is a double helix of two long chains. Those are sequences of nucleic acids. And in particular, there's four, right? So there's these, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And they're arranged in all sorts of different combinations to make the DNA. There is a sugar molecule bonded to a phosphate molecule in each of these nucleotide pieces on this funny looking ladder. And you can imagine the phosphate sugar backbone as the two long pieces on the ladder. And you can imagine these bonded pairs of nucleic acids in the middle as the rungs on the ladder. And then you take that ladder and you twist it and you have a DNA double helix, ta-da. And the order of all of these um, different nucleotides up and down the DNA chain is the DNA sequence. If you write it out, um, Hannah's going to talk more about this, you can write it out using just the first letter of each of these. And you literally, your sequence, a DNA sequence, is literally a string of those letters, right? A, T, C, G, A, 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 C, 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 D, no, G, G, G. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about a DNA sequence. Those encode all of your genetic information. There's also some sort of accumulated extra junk from all of the evolutionary things that have happened to your ancestors, ancestors, ancestors. And that's just your information. To get that translated into cellular processes or traits, the DNA needs to be rewritten into RNA, into proteins, and then they have to go off and do things. You have two kinds of DNA in your cells. For anyone who's like me, who sees a picture like this and their brain shuts down, look, I gave you a rat snake too. I got a whole <laughs> bunch of rat snake pictures this morning. So just pretend we're talking about the cells of the rat snake. And in the cells of the rat snake, there's a whole bunch of mitochondria, right? Those are the powerhouses of the cell. They're producing metabolic energy that the cell can use. And each of those has a circular piece of DNA called mitochondrial DNA. And short form is just mtDNA. Then in the nucleus of the cell, you have all of the nuclear DNA. That's where the chromosomes are, which are basically, you take that double helix ladder with all the DNA of that individual, and you kind of twist them up into chromosomes, and that's, that's where the chromosomes are stored. The important piece here is your mitochondrial DNA, each of you have exactly the same mitochondrial DNA as your biological mother. Your nuclear DNA, or that rat snake's nuclear DNA, is biparentally inherited. That means half of your nuclear DNA comes from your biological mother and the other half comes from your biological father. Yes? Okay, awesome. So a parent's nuclear DNA at each locus is randomly assorted into egg or sperm cells called gametes that they produce. So each gamete, each egg or sperm cell, contains half of the material needed to create a new embryo right? Or half of the material of the organism creating the egg or the sperm cells. When we talk about loci, this is all we mean. One locus is one location on the DNA or one stretch of the DNA. It can be really short, can be really long. You can define it however you need. That's all it means. It's a spot on the DNA. If you have more than one locus, you have many loci. When we talk about genes, we're specifically talking about stretches of DNA, so loci, that are containing the code for a particular trait or process. So not that extra accumulated junk. Cool. So because we're all herpers, let's say we have a turtle. We'll call her mom. And let's say that we can get mom's DNA. Okay, so we go out and we like catch a bunch of turtles and we take blood samples 
And then we store them really, really well so that we can do things with them later. So they're either going into ethanol or lysis buffer or flash frozen, or we put them on these handy dandy, really expensive blotting cards. And then we can take those samples back to the lab. And then from there, we can extract DNA from the sample. And that blood has all sorts of stuff in it as well as the turtle's DNA, right? Like all the other bits of the cell, bunch of proteins. So we also have to purify it. We have to get all that extra gunk out because it's gonna mess with the chemical reactions we need to do later. And we do this with their commercial DNA extraction kits. That's not the point of this conversation, but I'm telling you that if that sounds complicated, it's not. They come with printed instructions and you literally just follow the instructions. So you extract the DNA from the sample, you pur purify it, and then we can amplify the DNA using polymerase, chain reaction, or PCR. It's not as complicated for, for people who do PCR, just bear with me, but for the rest of you, like me before I started my PhD, it's not complicated. So the DNA has two strands, right? And they're complementary to each other. And the cool thing about DNA is that it can replicate itself. That's why life works. So to amplify your little bit of DNA that you've got in your purified sample, it's not enough to sequence it yet. You need to make it a much bigger amount. So to amplify it, you're basically going to repeatedly heat the DNA that makes the strands separate and then cool it, making them come back together again. So far, so good? Okay, in the mixture you use to do that, you're also gonna throw a whole bunch of free nucleic acids, those A, T, C, and G, yeah? So now when you heat, uh, when you heat it up and there's some other chemicals in there to help along, you heat it up, the strands separate, both strands end up with new strands attached to them. You keep doing that again and again and again, and suddenly you have a whole bunch of DNA. If you wanted to look at a particular piece of that DNA, you would use primers to pick out a particular locus or loci. Remember, those are just our location on the DNA. Primers, just a little strip of nucleic acids with the sequence that will attach to that. So now when we open up our two strands of DNA in our reaction, the primers that we also added to the mix are gonna attach here and here, sorry, here and here, and we're gonna get just that piece, amplifying again and again and again. Now you magically have enough of the DNA to sequence, I wish mine had gone this well the first time, I'm just saying. Um, and this just means that you're gonna read the nucleotide sequence. And then you can compare the nucleotide sequences or the length of the piece, depending what method you're using. And then you can compare the genetic diversity among individuals. Any questions so far? Love it. So let's say we've <clears throat> tried to sequence mom's DNA. And at that particular locus, we found, because this is nuclear DNA, that she has two copies of that locus. We'll call those alleles. So she has these two copies. We're just going to call them different colors for now. She's got a black allele and a pink allele. I'm going to break for a minute to just give you some PCR bits that are going to help for Steve's talk. Let's say you run your PCR and you successfully amplify DNA. You use either a uh, like a nanodrop machine or you run a gel and you find there is amplified DNA. Yay, but wait, DNA is everywhere and it can get into everything. It's in the air. If you took an air sample from this room with a little bit of luck, you'd be able to pick up the genetic material of almost everybody in this room, for real. So your sample can get contaminated during collection, during storage, during DNA extraction, during PCR, if you're chemicals are not clean or your equipment's not clean. And so when you run that PCR and you amplify your DNA, you're also going to run the same reaction with the same mix. Hello, Hi. come on in. You, you wanna pick a table that has other people at it. Okay, awesome. Um, so you're gonna run your PCR with a negative control, which is usually clean water, very, very clean water. If your negative control amplifies DNA, there's some extra DNA in there somewhere that you didn't mean to put in there. And that tells you that you can't trust the rest of the reaction. You have to go back to the beginning and redo it. In the other direction, what if you run your PCR and you don't successfully amplify DNA? You have a couple options here. Maybe something went wrong in the reaction. You can check your chemicals, you can check your run parameters, or Maybe your DNA sample is too degraded to amplify well, and then you can improve your sampling and storage protocols. You can tell the difference by including a positive control in your PCR. 
And a positive control is a sample of DNA that you've used again and again and again and again, and you know that it's great and you know that it works. So if the positive control doesn't amplify, it tells you that something went wrong in the reaction. And if the positive control amplifies, but all of your test reactions don't, there's something wrong with your DNA. Let's go back to mom. Let's say we have genotyped mom at three loci. So now you know that that means we figured out what mom's alleles are at three different locations on the DNA. And let's say that we also have offspring from the last nest that mom made. So we've got a whole bunch of baby turtles. And then we, I'm just going to bribe you to pay attention by putting hurt pictures in. <laughs> and then we take samples from the baby turtles and we extract their DNA as well. And we can see that at locus one, we've got for these four hatchlings, some nice variation, right? And we can figure out because we know what mom has at locus one, we can figure out which of those alleles came from mom, right? And then we can figure out which alleles came from dad. And if we do this enough, we can figure out dad's genotype at this first allele, even if we've never caught dad. Or if we have caught dad, we can figure out dad's genotype and then connect that nest back to dad by matching the genotypes, right? But wait, what's wrong with this picture? Somebody who's not Tom. Yeah. Should have said Tom or Leslie. So each turtle can only carry two alleles at a locus, right? So this is actually dad's. We've got evidence here for multiple paternities, more than one father contributing to a nest. So we've got mom and we've got the dads and we can do this at all these different loci. And the reason that I'm showing you this all put together is because you'll notice in this example that we've got evidence for multiple paternities here and here, but at our third locus, we don't because the same alleles were coming from both of our dads, right? And this is just trying to illustrate for you why you wanna look at more than one locus when you're doing these analyses. If we did the same kind of analysis, among populations, we could get genotypes for a good sample from each population, let's say from each of these tables, right? And actually, no, that's not a good sample size. Let's say like this side of the room and this side of the room, and then we could compare them. And we could look at the frequency of different alleles in this population and that population, and we could infer whether there's gene flow between them, right? We could infer how long they've been isolated approximately, if they've become very different, and so on and so on. So far, so good? Okay, awesome. So thinking back to your evolution classes, over many generations, there are four key processes that can alter genetic diversity within a population, or three and then an add-on because reality. To get a new allele that's not already in the population, there's only one way that can happen. Woo, thank you. So we've got new alleles coming up through mutation. That whole process of DNA replicating itself, it's not perfect. Sometimes mistakes happen, right? And the sequence changes slightly as the DNA is being replicated from one generation to another, and then you get new alleles. Or we could have a process of natural selection, right? Where some alleles confer a fitness advantage. Somebody remind me and everybody else what fitness is in an evolutionary ecological context. Sorry? Close? Yeah, so the survival is the first piece. You have to survive long enough to reproduce and you have to successfully reproduce and get your genes into the next generation, right? So fitness is sort of a relative measure of how well each individual is doing that. If a particular allele contributes to a trait, that's just a characteristic, that makes it more likely that you're gonna survive and successfully reproduce, then that allele is more likely to be passed on. And then the opposite, right? If allele makes it less likely that you're going to survive and reproduce, it's less likely to be passed on. Over time, that means that the alleles that confer a benefit are more likely to accumulate in the population. And then we have a random process as well which we call genetic drift. And this is just the probability through complete random chance that allele, an allele will or won't be passed on from one generation to another. These two things operate together. They are both important. It's always both. 
Remember that some of the loci on the, on, are in everybody's DNA are believed to be non-coding. This is sometimes called junk DNA. This is a topic of great debate, and we're not having that debate here. I'm just letting you know. Um, but the chance of the alleles at those neutral loci being passed on, if they're really not under selection, should be 100% random, right? And that means that if we focus on putatively neutral loci in our analyses, we're mostly estimating the effect of genetic drift. And when we focus our analyses on alleles that are under selection, we are estimating the joint effects of selection and genetic drift. So far, so good? Okay. And then the add-on here is obviously if, and this is the important piece from a conservation point of view, if new individuals come into the population, they bring their new genetic material, and that is almost always a good thing. Okay, so if you take a look at your tables, you will see a nice little pot of chocolates that you can eat after you have done this. <laughs> and uh, for folks on Zoom, I believe that Hannah is going to drop, has dropped the um, scenario pages in there. And so you're going to do a really quick simulation to try and understand how genetic drift and selection work together. Okay. So the first, you just need to look at the first page for now. We're just on the first page and we're going to go through it together. So don't worry about painfully reading it. So in our first scenario, we are imagining that we have, see, I'm bribing you with pictures. We have a gecko. It could even be a felsuma. And in this case, we're going to model what happens when a gecko population is not under selection at all. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is start with 10 individuals. So those little chocolates are each geckos. Can you please pull out, and you should have two colors, pull out 10 individuals of one color. Okay, does everybody have 10 of one color pulled out? Okay, now put one of them back and take one of another color because, oh my gosh, we've had a mutation occur. And in this case, the mutation affects the gecko's color but it does not affect their chance of survival. There's nothing about this slightly different, amazing color on the gecko that has the mutation that changes its chance of survival. So the only thing that's going to change um, how this new allele moves in the population is genetic drift. So the next thing you're gonna do is take your dice and you're gonna use the dice to determine your, your next generation. So each of your 10 individuals is going to reproduce. It's gonna have replace itself with two individuals. So far, so good? Okay, so now you need to create your next generation. If you have a purple gecko, it's going to make two purple geckos. So you replace one purple ball with two purple balls. If you have an orange gecko, it's gonna make two orange geckos. Can you create your next generation? Each of your, each of your geckos in this generation is going to reproduce. You're gonna have two geckos for each of the first geckos you had. Okay, so they actually going to want to lose all out. My bad. Whoops. Okay. So this one yeah. is going to become these two, right? Yeah. And so on. Okay. And then you pop them all in there. That's okay. So what you're going to do, whoops. Okay, here we go. Each of these geckos is going to reproduce, right? So this gecko is going to become two black geckos. This gecko uh, is going to become gecko. two orange geckos yeah. and so on. So you want to drop them all in the cup. Oh, I see. Okay. Hi. Ooh. We have no idea. Dramatic. That's okay. <laughs> so you've got, like yeah. Very yeah. Okay. Uh, That's your new generation. Huh? So that goes in here. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Pretty much. Yep. <laughs> Hey, okay, you guys, yeah. <laughs> how's it going? You've got your new generation? Yes. Sir. Once you've got your new generation, tip everything else out of the cup and stick it in the cup. Hi. You got your new generation? Yes. Awesome. So then you're going to pop them all right in here. Okay. You guys good? Okay. Okay, once you have your next generation... Okay, once you have your next generation, it's time to figure out who's going to survive to reproduce. 
So the next thing you're going to do is take out a pair of geckos. You don't, don't look, just take out a pair of geckos at a time and roll one dice to decide who makes it to the next generation. If you roll one, two, or three, your original color wins. If you roll four, five, or six, the new allele wins. If you pull a pair that are both the same color, you don't have to think about it because it, it wouldn't matter. You just chuck one in your new population. Just for the sake of time, um, can I see a show of hands whose populations have already lost the mutant completely? Okay. Whose who's simulated populations of geckos have about somewhere near a half-half? Okay. Whose have mostly mutants in their population? No? What do you, what do you guys have? Eight to two, original to, okay. Did it go up and then down? Yeah. Nice. So the take home message here is with drift, it's random. And that means although some directions are higher probability than others, you'll see that in more cases than not, that very rare allele just kind of vanished from the population, right? Without leaving a mark. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to wave at you, Pam. Um, in, in some cases, it's, it's possible for it to go in a really unexpected direction, right? Because that's how probability works. So if you could do exactly the same thing again, except now that we've all got the hang of it, except this time, you're going to be considering, whoops, sorry. You're going to be considering a scenario where you have selection operating on that allele instead. And these three tables, are going to do a scenario of strong selection. So in this case, if you roll a one, you're starting from the very beginning again. If you roll a one, the mutant allele survives. Or sorry, the original allele survives. If you roll two, three, four, five, or six, the mutant allele survives. And this is basically mimicking what would happen if that color change made it far less likely for that gecko to be predated, okay? And on this side, you're going to make a slightly less strong simulation of selection. So where it's slightly less likely that the gecko will get predated. So in this case, if you roll a one or a two, the original survives. And if you roll three, four, five, or six, then the mutant survives. Okay, go for it. Four, you're finished. Can I see? So we had strong selection over here. Right? And we would expect that under particularly strong selection, that new allele would suddenly become much more common in the population much more quickly, right? That's the thing we'd expect. And under weaker selection, it would still become more frequent in the population, but more slowly, right? Or to a lesser extent. What did you guys actually find? What did you have, Jackie? Just stayed the same. Right? Yeah. Who else here just stayed kind of the same? Yours changed? Yours went way up? Well, How about at the okay? But it didn't go. It didn't go way up. How about at the back table? You just went way up, and the in the middle, Ginger's table. Sorry. Okay. So the, the your take home message here again is that genetic drift is really, really, really strong. So even under a strong selective pressure, sometimes you're going to have a massive increase in that advantageous uh, form of the animal, right? But, and we're not talking about alleles here, we're talking about like an actually expressed trait that is caused by genetic drivers, right? But in some cases, it might not, right? In some cases, drift will be stronger. The other thing you wanna keep in mind from a conservation point of view is that um, when we talk about um, adaptation or local adaptation to a particular condition, we often think about that as really, really advantageous and special and a thing we should protect, and that's true. And this is like, this is really important, right? You might have a new predator come in that can see both geckos just fine, right? For example, things change. So we're like, local adaptation is important, but right now at the rate of environmental change that we're facing, the current conditions everything is adapted to are 
fizzing out, right? So it's like, we need to also think about what's make, making it more likely for populations to persist. And this is the really important piece that I want you to take away from this. You already saw how strong genetic drift can be even under a scenario of strong selection. And genetic drift acts really quickly on small populations. On larger populations, it's random over time, you know, like, like the bats pre white nose syndrome, right? Like big population, lots of variation, drift is affecting them, obviously. But it's slow and it's, you know, it's unlikely for an allele to be driven completely out of the population over time. In a small population, it's very, very likely that you have these dramatic changes in genetic variation. And that can cause this thing that we call an extinction vortex where you have a small population, genetic drift and potentially inbreeding depression sometimes or inbreeding in general cause a loss of genetic variability and that can cause a reduction in individual fitness and you lose your adaptive variation or sorry, your adaptive potential, right? You get lower reproduction, higher mortality. This is lower fitness, right? Survival and, and reproduction. And you get a smaller and smaller population, right? And we think about this as a sort of vortex that eventually drives the population to extinction. Really quick detail, when we think about inbreeding and inbreeding depression, they're not the same thing. Inbreeding is mating with closely related individuals. It reduces genetic variation, totally does. Inbreeding depression happens when inbreeding also reduces fitness. You can all think of human examples in both cases, right? And it's more likely that you'll get inbreeding depression in small populations because it's more likely that you'll get inbreeding. For example, yes. <laughs> what inbreeding always does is reduce adaptive potential. So even when you don't have inbreeding depression, you're still losing genetic variation. You're losing your adaptive potential. And when white nose syndrome or something shows up, you're in trouble. And then the last thing I wanted to note on this slide is that small populations aren't always inbred. Our tiny little spotted turtle populations I was all ready to be like, oh, look, I have a high inbreeding coefficient. They, they're not. So I don't know if they just don't like mating with close relatives or what, but it, you don't necessarily find inbreeding in small populations. So I'm going to wrap up here um, with these sort of five principles that are in the PDF version of this that um, Pam and Hannah could distribute if they want. Um, and I'm not going to take a lot of time on it because I want to move on to Hannah's um, point. But basically, our like, five important points for conservation genetics are small. Oh, I did add the citation. Oh, maybe it's in the wrong version. I'm sorry. I will email you all the citations. <laughs> okay. Our five important points here are when a population is small, that's just census size is the number in the population. When a population is small or it's gone through a really strong bottleneck, you get reduced variation. That's really obvious. When you have a small population, you're more likely to have inbreeding depression. When you have a small population, you're more likely to get reduced fitness through just drift, right? And when you have a small population, you don't have the same ability to respond to changes, right? You can't respond to selection as well. And finally, if you add individuals from somewhere else to a small population, more times than not, it improves fitness and it improves performance and it can help pull them back from the brink. So. I'm not going to make space for questions here because it's definitely Hannah's turn, but I just want you to keep that in mind as we go on. Like it's important to preserve genetic diversity, but like in your roles with the chocolate, genetic diversity changes from one generation to the next. Always. That's the whole point. It is not important to preserve for no particular reason, one particular snapshot in time of a population's genetic profile. Right? So Hannah. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I can get your attention. Okay. Uh, first of all, can everyone hear me at the back of the room? Maybe just give me a yeah. Okay. Perfect. If at any point you can't, please just uh, let me know, and I'll try and yell more. Um, okay. So hi everyone. My name is Hannah. I'm really happy to be here alongside Christina and Steve uh, doing this workshop with you. Um, today I'm going to try and give you a very brief history of some different conservation genetic techniques that have been used in the past and are currently being used today. Um, so I just wanted to start with some definitions. Christina covered a lot of this, which is great for me. I can mostly skip through it, uh, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, importantly, um, when we're talking about the genome, we're talking about the complete set of DNA that's within an organism. Um, again, mutations, Christina covered this really great, but any changes in DNA sequence, it's a source of genetic diversity. 
um, alleles are alternate forms of the same gene or genetic marker, uh, depending on what you're talking about. A uh, locus, again, when I talk about a locus, it's just a particular location on the genome of a gene or a mutation or a marker, whatever it is that you're talking about. Um, and genetic markers, which is going to be the focus of this presentation, is just any identifiable segment of DNA uh, that we can use to make some uh, conclusions about an individual or a population. I don't really need to cover this because Christina already did, but when we're talking about sequencing, we're just talking about taking the DNA and then figuring out what the actual sequence of uh, nucleotides is. And then one other term that I wanted to cover that you maybe have seen if you've read some population genetic papers uh, is sequencing depth and coverage. Um, so if we're doing something like sequencing the entire genome of an individual, what we get back from the sequencers is not the actual whole string of DNA from start to finish. It's way too long to do that. Uh, so what we get back is all these little chopped up sequences of DNA uh, also called reads. And what we have to do using computer programs is basically put them all together, figure out where they overlap. And this can be done with or without a reference genome. It's much easier if you have a reference genome. Uh, otherwise, you can think of it as trying to like assemble a puzzle without looking at the picture on the box. Uh, so because it comes back in all these little chopped up segments, some parts of the genome are going to be covered by more reads than others. And that's the sequencing depth. So if we look at this location here, you can see that there's uh, the sequencing depth is four. So there's four reads that cover that uh, one location on the genome. Whereas over here, the sequencing depth is two. And then uh, sequencing coverage is just the average depth across the genome or whatever part of the genome your sequencing is. So here it's just a little over two times coverage. And this is an important concept because the greater your sequencing coverage is, the more confidence you have in your results, uh, but it's also more sort of resource uh, intensive and costs more money generally to sequence at a higher depth. Okay, so here's just a roadmap of the markers that I'm going to uh, cover today. I'm just going to briefly touch on a bunch of different genetic markers that have historically been used and are currently being uh, used for conservation genetic purposes. I just want to give the caveat that I'm by no means an expert on this. Um, most of this is from reading the literature, not from doing the techniques myself. Um, and I'm just going to give a very broad overview of these, try and give a brief explanation, um, some examples and some pros and cons of the different methods, just to give you a taste of what's out there. Uh, but all of these methods have extensive literature just on each one. Uh, Okay, so one of the earliest methods used of uh, assessing genetic diversity was allozyme electrophoresis. And this was first used to measure genetic diversity in the 60s. Um, and the way it works is by uh, separating out different versions of proteins or allozymes um, based on their charge and molecular weight. So if anyone's ever run DNA on a gel, um, you know that they basically migrate through the gel and uh, different charge or different weight proteins will go further or not as far. So if you have different versions present in your sample, you'll get multiple bars on your gel. Um, and in this way, you can also see if an individual is homozygous for that protein. So this individual here will be homozygous for a version of the protein that didn't go very far. This individual is homozygous for a version of the protein that went a little further. And then this individual has both versions of that protein, so they're heterozygous. And this is just an early example of this being used uh, for conservation. So this was looking at endangered uh, Asiatic lions on the left here, or sorry, on the right, you're right, yeah, uh, compared to African lions. And what they found was that uh, they had lower genetic diversity. So you can see that the sort of allozyme profile across the board looks very similar, uh, but there was more diversity here. Okay, uh, moving on to the late 1990s, early 2000s, where PCR-based methods uh, became more popular. I don't have to explain PCR because Christina already did, but just a quickly reminder, it's just where you take a sequence of DNA and you can get a lot of copies of it. Uh, so for these methods now, instead of looking at proteins, now we've moved into actually looking at DNA. I'm not going to go into all of these for the sake of time, um, and they're not as commonly used anymore, but the gist of the rapid markers um, 
is that you use basically randomly generated primers. And a primer is just a small sequence of DNA that can be used to find a part of the genome, the part that you're interested in sequencing. Um, and because these are randomly generated, you can get sort of hits from across the genome. Um, and then they run the DNA this time out on a gel and uh, see how many hits they have for, for these different primers. Um, one of the main problems with this method is that you end up largely with genes that display uh, dominance inheritance is what it's called. So you basically get presence absence data uh, for this method. So this could be an example uh, where if you have an individual that was a homozygote uh, for the, the primer or a heterozygote, they're both going to show up on the gel. But if you, they don't have that, if they have a version that's different than what the primer is picking up, it's not going to show up at all. So the main takeaway just is that you lose some information because you can't distinguish the homozygote and heterozygotes. And AFLP and RFLP methods are similar, um, but they, but a little bit different. And they have different pros and cons, which I've summarized here. But for the sake of time, we're just going to keep moving forward. OK, so this is an example, a herp example. I know you've all been waiting for it uh, with the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. Uh, using rapid markers. So this is from work done in 1994 by Lyle Gibbs and colleagues. Um, so they were looking at two populations of eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. Uh, so this is in Ontario. These are the Great Lakes. Uh, there's two populations on Bruce Peninsula and Georgian Bay. And they were looking to see if these populations were differentiated. Uh, so they used four rapid markers and 10 rattlesnakes. And their conclusion was that there was no differentiation between these two populations. OK, uh, now moving into more uh, sequencing-based methods. So in these previous examples, we were, they were looking at the DNA, but they weren't actually getting the DNA sequences themselves. Um, but in all of the methods that we'll be talking about next, we'll act, we're actually getting sequencing data this time. Uh, so first, talking about mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so if you'll remember from Christina's presentation, this is the circular haploid DNA that's found in your mitochondria. And haploid just means that there's one copy. So in your nuclear uh, DNA, you have two copies, one from mom, one from dad. Your mitochondrial genome, you're only inheriting from your mom. Um, and for mitochondrial-based methods, um, sometimes the entire genome is sequenced, and then we look for differences. Uh, you can also just target specific genes. And um, some of the pros associated with the, this method is that because it's haploid, um, and also generally much smaller than your nuclear genome. It's uh, easier to sequence and easier to analyze. Uh, and it's also mostly protein coding genes. Um, so I think it's like 97% or something is protein coding genes, whereas in your nuclear genome, you have a lot more of that junk DNA or structural DNA that's not necessarily coding for proteins. Uh, this is also a good method uh, because you can do it with lower quality DNA. So often this is possible using more non-invasive sampling methods uh, like scat samples or hair samples, um, which is obviously a lot less invasive than doing something like blood sampling. Uh, and mitochondrial genes are also highly conserved across taxa. Uh, so one of the pros is that even if you don't have necessarily the specific sequencing data for your uh, target species, you, you're often able to target these mitochondrial genes um, because they'll be similar to, to a related species. Um, but some cons, um, of course, you're only you're not getting any information about the nuclear genome. You're just focused on the mitochondrial genome and it's maternally inherited. So you're only getting information from that sort of one side of the ancestral lineage rather than from both parents. Uh, and you also end up with fewer variable sites, so less data to analyze uh, than some of the SNP based methods that I'll be talking about a little bit later. I've broke it again. <laughs> okay. Cool. Gotcha. Okay. Um, okay. So now let's look back at our Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake uh, example. Uh, lucky for us, these same two populations have also been uh, assessed using mitochondrial DNA. Um, so this is from Ray et al. in 2013. Uh, in this study, they included 179 rattlesnakes from across the whole range, which you can see in the map here and about 20 um, from the Ontario populations. And here they sequenced one mitochondrial uh, gene, which is the NADH dehydrogenase 2 gene. Don't worry about what that does, but um, that's what it was. 
and they were able to identify 19 different versions of that gene, which are called haplotypes. And you can think of haplotypes as being like genotypes, but for the haploid uh, gene. So instead of having heterozygotes or homozygotes, because everyone only has one version, they just have one of 19 different versions of that gene. And some of them will be more similar to each other than others. And they were able to use that information to sort of assign three different um, haploid groups, which you can see with the different colors. And again, we see that the Georgian Bay and Bruce Peninsula populations come out as being very similar. They're in the same haplotype group, uh, but we're seeing an indication that there might be some differences as there's some unique uh, hap haplotypes uh, in the Georgian Bay population. Um, okay. Okay, moving on to microsatellites. Um, these are very commonly a very common method for population genetic studies, um, still used very commonly today. Um, and what microsatellites are, are regions of the genome where a small sequence of DNA is repeated a variable number of times with, among individuals. So for example, if the sequence is CA, you might have an individual where the repeat is only twice, so CA, CA. And then another individual where that's repeated 10 times, another individual where it's 15 times. And each different number of repeats is considered a different allele. Uh, so we can look at uh, genetic diversity by looking at the number of different alleles that are present in different populations. And some pros of this method, uh, again, it's relatively simple to sequence and analyze. Um, it's been used a lot, so there's lots of resources out there for analyzing these kinds of data. Uh, these are highly variable regions of the genome because they're so repetitive. Um, and they show codominance inheritance. So you don't have that same problem that I was talking about earlier with the rapid markers. Uh, you can distinguish heterozygous, homozygous uh, for different alleles. Again, this is a method that can be used with lower quality DNA. So if you're doing non-invasive sampling, this is another um, method that can be used. But some of the cons, uh, you're restricted to certain parts of the genome and you can't really assess, uh, for example, genes that have known uh, adaptive impact. Um, because you're sort of restricted to these repetitive regions of the genome. And again, you also get a smaller number of markers uh, than some of the methods that I'll be talking about after this. And microsatellites also need to be specifically developed for each species, uh, so you do need some prior genetic knowledge of the species, um, or hope that someone has already done it for your species, in which case it's a lot easier. And it's been done for the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake, same two populations. Um, so this is a study done by Michelle DeLeo in Steve's lab. Um, they, in this case, they used 12 microsatellite loci and a much larger sample size of 308 rattlesnakes. And you can see the sampling scheme is much more finely distributed as well. This time they found that not only was the Bruce Peninsula and Georgian Bay populations genetically distinct, but that the populations north and south of Perry Sound, which is in the middle here-ish, uh, were also genetically distinct. Um, and then I also just wanted to take a second to quickly explain the plots. Um, if you've read many population genetic papers, these kind of plots come up a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to explain the way they work. So, um, what they did in this paper was they did this analysis for all of the samples, which is how they found those initial three groups. Um, but then they also did it within Bruce Peninsula and within Georgian Bay. So this is the results from just looking at the populations from that Georgian Bay population. Uh, and the way it works is it takes all of the information about the genetic variation that you've given it, and then gives you the likelihood that there are sort of K different numbers of genetic clusters within that group. Uh, so it looks at if you break it into one group or two groups or three groups, and then it tells you which is most likely uh, based on the data that you've given it. So when they were looking at these Georgian Bay uh, samples, the most likely K number was four. So you can see there's four different colors in the plot here. And the way it works is that each bar is an individual. And then each uh, color is one of, representing one of those genetic clusters. And then the proportion of the bar for each individual, that is each color, is showing you how much of their uh, genetic variation can be assigned to each of those genetic clusters. So we see we have some individuals that very strongly assign to just one color, 
whereas uh, some seem like they might be the product of a little bit more admixture between different regions. Okay, um, I also just wanted to briefly touch on um, target genes. So this is where if you have a particular gene of interest, maybe you know it has some kind of adaptive function, uh, you can sequence just that gene. Uh, similar to looking at the mitochondrial genes, but this time we're talking about nuclear genes. And I just wanted to highlight uh, MHC genes, which are a common target for these kinds of studies. Uh, stands for major histocompatibility complex. And this is a region of genes that are important for immunity. Um, basically, the more variation you have in these genes, the more variable of an immune response you can have. Um, so you can imagine why that would be of interest often for conservation applications. And uh, this is just a quick example. Wanted to keep in theme with the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. Um, this is from Illinois, but they were looking at both microsatellite and uh, MHC gene variation in their populations. And the reason they did this is that with the microsatellites, they could get at more of that neutral variation across the genome. Whereas with the MHC genes, they were getting more of that adaptive variation. So looking at those sort of two different kinds of genetic variation. Okay, we're getting through it, bear with me. <laughs> uh, now we're moving into um, SNP-based methods. And SNP, or SNP, stands for a single nucleotide polymorphism. Sounds really long, but the, what it is is right in the title. It's basically just a single nucleotide change uh, between either an individual and a reference genome or between individuals. So maybe one individual has ACT at a particular locus and another individual has ATT. So that single nucleotide change is a SNP. Um, and the first method I'm going to talk about is RADSeq. There's a bunch of different kinds of RADSeq, but I just wanted to give an idea of the general concept. Uh, so basically you have uh, restriction enzymes that will target a specific sequence of DNA and um, go find that, that segment of DNA and cut it. And then you can PCR amplify all those little strips of DNA for multiple individuals. So basically what you end up with is the same sequence of DNA from across the genome uh, for all of your individuals. And then you can line them up kind of like this and just look for any places where you see a single nucleotide change or a SNP. Um, so here we can see there's a T to an A, here's a C to a G. Some individuals will have the change and some won't. Um, some advantages of RADSeq are that you don't necessarily need a reference genome, although it does help a lot with this analysis. Um, you get quite high coverage with this method um, because you have all these just sort of little slices of genome. And again, this is a very commonly used method, so there's lots of resources out there for um, analyzing this kind of data. Um, cons is that, again, we're just targeting a limited part of the genome, and it's kind of random. So if there's a gene that you're really interested in, no guarantees that you're going to get a SNP in that region. Um, and if you don't have a reference genome, it can be hard to even figure out where those SNPs are falling along the genome. Oh, sorry. Okay. There's your pros and cons. Um, okay. Another method is SNP panels. Um, so this is where you start with a large number of SNPs, and then you basically take a subset of them uh, that you are interested in for various applications. And you can genotype individuals just for those SNPs. So you can kind of end up with something like this, where for each of those uh, locations of the SNPs, you can figure out which nucleotide uh, your individuals have, and if they're heterozygous or homozygous for those SNPs. Um, some pros of this method is that once you have the panel developed, um, they are a simpler method to uh, sequence and analyze compared to some of the more um, sequencing intensive methods. And, and another really big pro of this is you can use non-invasive sampling methods and do it with quite low quality DNA. But on the other hand, you do need to start with a large number of SNPs um, to narrow it down to the SNPs that you want. So it's quite a large sort of bioinformatic and sequencing um, investment up front. Um, but you can design these panels to be very flexible and do a wide variety of things uh, like parentage assignment or looking at cryptic species or subspecies. Um, individual identification, relatedness, uh, and population diversity and differentiation if you include a large, a large enough number of SNPs. 
And so here are four really cool examples of um, SNP panels in action uh, for conservation applications for polar bears, Iberian lynx, uh, orange-bellied parrots, and the western rattlesnake. Um, and I just wanted to highlight here kind of the variation in the number of SNPs that were used for, and the different um, applications. So for the Iberian lynx, you can see they only had 48 SNPs in their panel. But with that, they were able to look at parentage and relatedness, uh, identify individuals, and look at hybridization all the way up to the orange-bellied parrot example with over 900 SNPs. And in this, again, they looked at parentage and relatedness, but were also able to assess genetic diversity and um, population differentiation. Okay, on to the last technique, uh, which is whole genome sequencing. And this is exactly what it sounds like. You're sequencing the entire genome of an individual, start to finish, more or less. Um, and I just also wanted to point out, you can also do, you can do this at the individual level, but you can also do it at the population level um, by basically pooling individuals from a population and then sequencing it at the population level, and that's called pool seek. And um, you lose individual level information if you do this, uh, but one advantage is you get really high coverage uh, because you're pooling all of these DNA samples. And then if you do whole genome sequencing uh, for calling SNPs, again, it's a similar process as to RADSeq. You basically can line all your individuals up and find places on the genome where those, there's those single nucleotide changes. Uh, but the big difference here is you can get a ton of data doing it this way, uh, millions of SNPs to analyze. That might be a good or a bad thing, <laughs> depending on how much you like data analysis. <laughs> Um, some, uh, so yeah, so that's basically the biggest benefit of this method is the huge amount of data you get. You can do pretty much whichever genomic analysis you, uh, want to do with the caveat of it depends a little bit on the number of samples you have and the sampling scheme and any associated metadata that you might need. Um, cons are you need a reference genome, at least of a closely related species, um, to do this. Otherwise you have to be assembling your own genome, which I'm not going to get into, but it takes a lot more. Uh, a lot more time and effort. Um, and it can be a more expensive method for sure because you are sequencing so much data, uh, but that cost will scale with the number of samples that you include as well as the coverage and the size of the genome of the species that you're sequencing. Okay, don't worry about trying to read this. I just wanted to try and summarize all the information um, on the slides previous. I'm happy to share these slides if anyone's interested. Um, so this is just a summary of the sort of pros and cons and potential applications. And then I just wanted to highlight there's lots of papers out there that go a lot more in depth into how genomics can assist with conservation applications, um, especially as newer sequencing uh, methods are becoming more accessible and more popular. And these are just a few that I've personally found um, very helpful. Okay, so now we're going to move on to a little activity where you all will be sequencing your own genomes and um, calling SNPs uh, with, with that data. So maybe just hold off on grabbing the envelopes until I finish explaining, um, but you all have envelopes on your table. There'll be eight with names on them. So these are all of the individuals that you've sampled. You can think of it as being your favorite herp, whatever your study species is. Uh, you've collected them from across the range and you're trying to figure out how many populations there are and who belongs to which population. And there's also an envelope labeled answers Please wait till the end to open that one. <laughs> um, so basically each envelope will contain sequencing data. So it's all those chopped up sequences like what I showed, and you're gonna have to figure out what the actual genome sequence is. Uh, don't worry, it's not really a whole genome. It's only 21 nucleotides long. Um, some helpful hints is that the overlaps can be more than one nucleotide long, and that sequencing depth does vary across the genome. So as a group, what I want you to do is Assemble your genomes, identify SNPs, and then figure out how many populations there are and who belongs to each population. And I've put some discussion questions up there if you want to chat amongst yourselves or just to think about uh, later. And just to highlight or to just show exactly what I mean by this is if this was the sequencing data you had, you basically just need to figure out where they overlap to get your final sequence. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, sorry if that cut it a bit short, but just show of hands, was everyone able to assemble all eight genomes? 
Yeah, it's got it in the middle. Yes. And people able to do it in five steps. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to how many populations there were? Two? Correct. Yay. Yeah. Who was in each population? Oh, um, the one population was Rachel, Phoebe, Joey, and Chandler, and the other one was Mike, Gunther, Ross, and Monica. That looks like <laughs> Right. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I uh, I was able to uh, get a guest lecturer for my uh, course on Thursday as I tried to fly out of uh, Toronto. So that's a sweet bonus. Uh, can, and can I just say before I begin, it really warms the cockles of my heart to see Alzheimer's resurrected <laughs> and discussed. Um, Les and I actually were mentored in part by uh, Jim Bogart, and I still remember him in the laboratory without gloves, stirring up the elixirs, inhaling, inhaling it, tell it, yeah, with his pipe and his Sputnik coffee. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about environmental DNA, and with apologies, I'm probably going to be a little bit more jargon heavy. But Christina and Hannah have done a, a wonderful job at introducing some of the terms I'm going to build on. But what we're going to try to do is not flip through the slides too quickly. I'm going to give you an overview of environmental DNA in the very broadest sense, and I'll tell you why I say that. And that I've invited five, now four, because one just came down sick. So I have the pleasure of presenting his talk later on. We'll see how that goes. Uh, rapid fire talks by students or ex-students and postdocs in our lab who have actually deployed environmental DNA to answer particular questions. And then if we have time at the end, we'll open it up for questions and you can ask me about particular applications or the folks online as well. So I wanna start very broad and I'd like to start here. Um, Camilo uh, Mora in 2011 gave us what was probably the best estimate of the number of eukaryote species on the planet. And this one is, is much cited. And so he and his team suggested that there are about 8.75 million species of eukaryotes. That excludes viruses and bacteria. Of this, perhaps 1.5 to 2 million species have actually been described. And by described, I mean given a binomial designation. Um, in 2019, this uh, body, IBPES, it's spelled out there for you, estimated that 1 million of these species are at risk of extinction currently. It's kind of a mind blowing number. And what that means is that 75% of the species that are uh, out there are hypothetical and that a significant number are going to go extinct before we even describe them. Environmental DNA is, is one way that we can maybe gain purchase in some of this diversity. So we have this massive knowledge deficit. We have a knowledge deficit of species that we all love and are working on now, and we know that. In a rapidly changing world with climate change, invasive species, all of these different things, as Christina said, the world is changing very rapidly. And we need tools that can allow us to sort of gain insight in regular time, in real time effectively, so we can document these changes and try to mitigate them. Um, so the question really is, how do we track vast numbers of species and ecosystems in a on a temporal scale, scale that's as meaningful to management. And of course, I'm not going to start talking about near remote sensing or drone technologies. I'm going to talk about environmental DNA. So what is environmental DNA? I'm going to be very generous in my definition of what I mean by this. So it's any DNA in an environmental matrix, and this can be soil, sediment, uh, air, as Christina said, as you breathe in and out, we're breathing in each other's eDNA. I hope that doesn't sound too grotesque to you. Uh, but you're also breathing in and out all kinds of DNA from other organisms. Um, it can be found in permafrost, and I'm going to expand the definition to include feces here. That might be a controversial inclusion. eDNA proper is considered to be DNA that is free or floating or, or what have you in uh, any matrix. But it can be attached to cellular debris after cell lysis. It can be ab absorbed to particles in the air, in the water, in the soil. Um, and that's important when we talk about sedimentary DNA. And interestingly, of course, when we take a water sample or a soil sample, we're taking living organisms as well. 
Whether you would call that eDNA or not will really depend on who you talk to. I did want to note environmental RNA. I'm not going to talk about it, but those of you who are aficionados of wastewater monitoring for COVID-19 will know that coronavirus is an RNA virus. And so that monitoring was actually based on the presence of RNA. So where does eDNA come from? It'll probably be intuitively obvious, but I'm going to go through it anyway. Dead things, very important. So decomposing carcasses, and here I'm including plants, animals, microorganisms, fungi, uh, shed epidermal cells. So fish or amphibians have slime or mucus, um, and that contains DNA and it's shed into the, the environment. Reptile skin, once shed, uh, scutes from turtles will contain some DNA. Plant parts, feces and urine contain DNA, gametes, if you've ever swum in a coral reef, you're often swimming in a soup of broadcast spawn, um, and that contains DNA. And of course, as I've already alluded to, living organisms, including all of these wonderful things, um, if we take it very broadly. Now, the important thing here is to contemplate when we're talking about eDNA, and I'm talking about free eDNA here, I'm not talking about within living organisms, how long does it last? It's important to understand this life history of environmental DNA, because if we're gonna look for the signature of species in a particular matrix, we have to know what that signature means. There've been lots of studies, especially in water, which is what we do a lot in our laboratory. Um, and they suggest that it's generally a week or maybe up to a couple of weeks. And so that means that once you detect something in water, say, that that organism was, is present or was recently present. And that gives you some sort of notion of sort of shifts in composition over time. So you could look at migratory species, fish, for example, or birds, and look at the change in composition over time. But interestingly, I indicated being adsorbed to particles. And we're doing some work in our lab where you can actually take a sediment core and you can go back in time. And so you can actually detect species that once existed in a particular ecosystem um, and, and no longer do. And I think people are once again pushing the boundaries here, but we might be able to go back millennia in the right circumstances with the right kind of sediment. So it's, it's quite particular. But it does open up a, a sort of range of really exciting possibilities for looking at species that might have occurred 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago. So how can we detect the presence of, uh, of uh, eDNA? Um, and as you might imagine, the technology is moving incredibly quickly, and I'm not actually encompassing all of the different assay methods that we can use here. We use a fair number of these in our lab, um, but you can use traditional PCR. It's a little bit limited. Typically what a PCR, a traditional PCR will give you is presence absence. Is the species there or not? Although it can be a little more nuanced than that. We've been doing some of the second, although I'm not gonna talk about it here, lamp or loop mediated isothermal amplification. There's that jargon coming in, happy to talk about it, but I'm not gonna talk about it here. Talk about it later over a beverage is what I'm saying. Um, we have quantitative PCR, which is one of the most common species specific targeted tools. It's also sometime, sometimes called real time PCR. That moniker has fallen out of favor because there's also reverse transcription PCR, both of which are RT PCR. So I'm gonna go with qPCR. And then finally, digital PCR which is what that monstrosity in the lower right is. And we have one of those units in our lab right now. Those are all single taxon detection, single genus, or more usually a single species. And then we have multi-taxon detection. So DNA metabarcoding, and we will have uh, a little bit of a discussion there. Very powerful method, uh, fraught with challenges, including some of the bioinformatics that Hannah was talking about, times 10, um, although it's largely automated, and metagenomics. And metagenomics is where you just basically sequence everything, all DNA in a particular sample. I'm not going to talk about that. So most of the PCR assays that, that you will see in the literature, most of the PCR assays that we use are focused on organelle or genomes. Um, and both Hannah and Christina talked about mitochondrial genome. Uh, uh, of course, there's chloroplast, which also has its own genome. Um, and there actually have recently been some other genomes that have been discovered in other organelles in, uh, in, uh, in some deep sea taxa. So there are even more than this. And so the question is why? Why are we focusing on mitochondrial genes? And I've just summarized a, a few here. So the first point 
very important is just a sheer quantity argument. There are many more copies of an organeller genome relative to a nuclear genome. In any given tissue, particularly sort of energetically intensive tissue like muscle, you have lots of mitochondria, each of which will have its own mitochondrial genome per cell. And then mitochondria themselves can have multiple genomes, as can chloroplasts. And so if you take that all together, it means you'll get a lot more mitochondrial DNA uh, compared to sort of a, a, a comparable gene in, in a nuclear genome. Um, I think both Anna and Christina mentioned that mitochondrial DNA is circular. And the interesting physiological property, degradational property, let's just call it property, is that circular DNA resists degradation a little bit better than linear DNA. And so it means it might persist for just a little bit longer to give us that little chance at detection. Um, this other thing is historical serendipity. I had to work the word serendipity in there, one of my favorite polysyllabic words. There you go, there it's, it's done now. Um, and it turns out that mitochondrial DNA uh, was uh, the basis of the emergence of the field of phylogeography. Uh, so if any of you have read John Avis's book on phylogeography, you will know that it's largely based on animal mitochondrial DNA sequence phylogeography. And what that means is there are vast storehouses of DNA sequences that are available for your viewing pleasure in, store, or, uh, in repositories like GenBank, uh, Bold Systems based out of Guelph, which is the Barcoding of Life database or initiative. Um, and this is really important in DNA and metabarcoding as I will talk about, but it's also incredibly important when you're designing primers that are supposed to be species specific. You need those data. Um, and this was spoken about uh, previously. A bit of an aside, I've sort of leapt into the assay deep end there, mentioning all of those wonderful things. But of course you have to get your DNA sample into the laboratory. Uh, a few of you know me, very few. I'm a shy fella. Um, I started a PhD in uh, cancer genetics and I lasted four weeks and then I quit because I realized that I was going to be in the lab forever and ever and ever and then retire. Um, and I decided I needed to do field work and environmental DNA is wonderful because it sort of ties having to do field work, be in the field with the lab. So this is Madeline who you will hear from in just a little bit and she's doing some sampling for chorus frogs. And so what we have to do is go out and sample, then we have to preserve the DNA so that it will last a sufficiently long period of time to get it back to the lab. DNA extraction using one of the kits that Christina alluded to, or one of the old school phenol chloroform methods, and then you do your assay. Uh, we do a lot with water, so we have Nalgene bottles, really fancy schmancy stuff. We sterilize them. We'll go out and in a particular little wetland, we might take three water samples, so three liters. And then we'll have a, uh, a negative control, a field control. So we'll expose water to the air so that any uh, extraneous DNA that might contaminate our sample, we will have a record of that as we go in. Um, and then we'll filter the water through a polycarbonate filter, one micron pore size, if you're interested. I'll take notes. Um, then all you have is a filter, you put it in a tube and that's what you can take back. So you don't have to take back tons and tons of water, you can take back your, your little filter. Anyway, that's just a, a dramatic aside, a little soliloquy, if you will, about DNA. So these are the three methods I'd like to uh, talk to you about. And so I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail just to try to bring you to some greater understanding of how these work, forgive me. So I am gonna talk a wee bit of molecular biology, but really what I want you to get out of this is what can they do for you? How can they answer your question? So we're gonna talk about quantitative PCR, uh, we're going to talk about digital PCR, and then I'll uh, briefly go through DNA metabarcoding. Is that okay? All right. Can folks online hear me, Pam? Very good. So let's talk about quantitative PCR. First of all, I should say that all three methods that I'm talking about are PCR-based. So we've already heard what PCR is. So these are all taking relatively few copies of DNA and we're getting a ton of DNA at the end. But the interesting thing about quantitative PCR is that it amplifies uh, a specific region of, of the, the DNA, a portion of a gene like cytochrome B or 16S or ND2 or all those wonderful things. But that 
we've come up with a way of tracking how much there is at each cycle or each step. And it does so in two different ways. They're both fluorescence-based. So one is using a non-specific intercalating fluorescent dye. Intercalation just means it's something that inserts itself in between the nucleotides that Christina was talking about, but it's fluorescent. So the more dye you get incorporated, the stronger the signal. And the second is, is more specific. So if you're really interested in specificity, you can actually design a, a, a DNA probe that's specific to your sequence of interest. And it's labeled when it's incorporated into your Amplicon, that PCR product, the fluorescence is released. Bob's your uncle. Wanted to say that too, by the way. You've got fluorescence. So how do you go from positive, negative, or presence, absence with a simple PCR to actually getting some estimate of the concentration of your in template of interest, which is really the, the true sort of promise of qPCR? Well, the way you do it is you create a dilution series, and that's what's shown here is the result of a dilution series. So you do a tenfold dilution series of your template of interest, and then you dilute it tenfold. So here there are six different dilutions um, from the highest concentration to the lowest. And then you do qPCR on them. So here we have known original concentrations. We have a, uh, a, an amplification plot. So we have that um, uh, initial phase, then we have an exponential phase, and then we have a plateau phase. Um, and so we are going to compare our actual qPCR amplification plot of our actual natural sample to this known series. Is everybody with me there, more or less? Okay. So what you have at the very beginning in that initial phase right at the bottom of the graph, so we have number of cycles on the x-axis and the amount of fluorescence on the y-axis, is a, uh, uh, a, a beginning of the, the, the exponential phase. I only got two and a half hours sleep last night, so if I... Uh, you come up less and just knock me in the shoulder, okay? Um, we have a threshold. If you look at the bottom, that threshold is the beginning of the exponential phase. So that's when you go from just background fluorescence to where you're actually seeing pickup of signal. That's what you have to understand. So we define something called the QC. It's the quantification cycle. And it's the number of PCR cycles at which you're actually detecting the, the product that you're interested in. So now we have everything we need to actually run our real sample. This is the DNA extract that we took from the, the uh, environment, in our case, uh, a filter. And so let's have, in this hypothetical example, an amplification plot for the DNA sample of interest. You can see it falls between the third and fourth of this hypothetical tenfold dilution series. And so with a couple of very simple calculations, you can essentially take what you know to be true across your dilution series and estimate the concentration of that original, of that uh, DNA sample. So you have not only detection of the particular species with qPCR, but you have an estimate of the concentration. Does that make sense? That's the true power of qPCR. Um, and I should say that, that uh, I don't know if it was you, Christina, or you, Hannah, uh, in this instance, we're focused on designing primers that amplify a particular gene for only one species. So we're focusing in on a single species. I should have said that at the outset. So we've used this, for example, for stink pot turtles, musk turtles. I like the word or phrase stink pot because they're lovable as hell. <laughs> so I'd like to move on to digital PCR. So in qPCR, you get an estimate of the concentration, very powerful. And if you do it right with all of the appropriate positives and negatives, it, it really is an amazing uh, workhorse tool that we use in our lab all the time. And we're partnering with lots of NGOs and, and parks and so on. They're very interested in this. But recently, we've begun using digital PCR. And digital PCR is sort of as it sounds. It's more quantitative. And in an ideal world, if you do this right, you'll get an estimate, not of a concentration in your original DNA sample, but you'll actually get an estimate of the number of template copies. It's supposed to be incredibly sensitive. So you might theoretically, or should be able to theoretically, to pick up just a few mere copies of the template of the species of interest. 
starting out with those well-designed primers that only amplify that bit of that particular gene for that particular species. So you start with species-specific primer pairs that you've validated and tested time and time again. As an aside, don't assume that published primers are good. You always have to uh, test them yourself. Um, and then once again, we have fluorescent dyes or probes. So the interesting thing about digital PCR is that it partitions your original sample into thousands of different nanopartitions, these tiny little uh, chambers or little volumes. Um, so in our case, we use a BioRad digital droplet PCR. I'm not a paid emissary of BioRad, by the way. It's just the system we chose. And the idea here is we're trying to partition a sample into 20,000, each individual sample into 20,000 individual partitions using uh, an emulsifying oil. And within each of those 20,000 droplets, you might have no template if the template you're interested in is very rare or one copy or occasionally uh, just a few copies, but you also have reagent. So when you run the PCR, you're going to either have a positive or a negative, and then you count. Well, you don't sit there with 20,000 droplets and count. The machine does it for you. And theoretically, what you should then have is a direct estimate of the number of copies of template that were distributed in your 20,000 partitions. There are lots of other systems. Uh, there's a chiogen system that uses a, a nanoplate. It's all sort of microfluidics or nanofluidics, but incredibly powerful. It's so powerful that you really do have to contemplate about the possibility or contemplate the possibilities of, of positive contamination, which was alluded to previously. Um, and we have two laminar flow hoods that we use to try to control that possibility of contamination. So the last technique I'll talk about is PCR-based once again but it's fundamentally different in that digital PCR and quantitative PCR, we were trying to detect the presence and quantify the amount of DNA for a single taxon, a single species. But here, what we're trying to do is simultaneously identify multiple taxa within a sample. Um, it can be all vertebrates, although that's a challenging thing to do, uh, but you might wish to do all turtles, or you might wish to do all anurans or all macrophytes or some such thing. And here what you, you need is those repositories of DNA sequence, because you're going to get all of the sequences that you can for all of the frogs that might co-occur in your area. You're going to design primers in conserved regions that will, and here's the magic, amplify an area that is variable enough that you can identify all of the species of interest. And so when you do your PCR, you're not getting just one species, you're going to get all of the species of the group that you're interested in. Okay, so you need these primer pairs in highly conserved regions flanking this variable region. Um, and, and that's important. So metabarcoding refers to that fact. When you just sequence cytochrome oxidase, we talk about DNA barcoding, Paul A. Baer, an alumnus, by the way, of Queen's University Biological Station. Um, and uh, um, but here we're talking about metabarcoding because we're doing a whole bunch of species simultaneously. And it can even get more complicated because then you can do multi-marker metabarcoding where you incorporate multiple genes simultaneously. I'll show you how now. So this is out of the DNA manual that we've written that I'll allude to at the end that is freely available for everyone in this room. Uh, so let's imagine we have two samples. We've extracted the total DNA. This contains the DNA of everything. So it's the DNA of all plants, all whatever. We have our conserved primers. We're going to amplify the target gene fragment, and it's going to amplify all of the DNA sequence that is present for the suite of species for which we've designed these conserved primer pairs. Um, confusingly, the next step uh, has often been referred to as adding DNA barcodes to your DNA barcode. So I'm not going to use that phrase. I'm going to call it an index. So what we're going to do is add unique index identifiers and so for all samples or uh, for all DNA sequences that we've amplified in DNA sample A, they will have a unique short sequence index of DNA that we can subsequently pull out. We can identify it through it, all the other analyses. And we'll have a different DNA index for DNA sample B. And you can do this across tens, if not hundreds of samples, um, which is the, the true power here. What you're going to do then, because uh, sequencing is expensive, is you're going to pool all of those samples. That's what we call multiplexing. And then we're going to send it away 
to a genome center because it's no longer cost effective for us to do the sequencing ourselves. They sequence it usually on an Illumina platform, which has cornered the market on massively parallel sequencing. And then we will ultimately get the samples back. Just as an aside, um, depending on the technique that we're deploying, we can get files that contain, in, in Hannah's parlance, uh, we're talking about DNA sequences or reads, we can get samples back with 300 million or 400 million reads in a single file. So you can't, you, Tom and I can't just sit down over a beer and sort through that. And you can't do what you did at your table. So what that means is you often have a, a, need, a need of a computer cluster. You will demultiplex it, which means pulling apart the samples into their original provenance. Uh, you will filter them doing all kinds of things like trimming off all the extemporaneous sequence. You will filter them, getting rid of the stuff that doesn't look good. And then ultimately what you're going to end up with is a whole series of stacks or clusters of sequences that are very similar, that are distinct from other clusters. And then you compare it to your reference database and you'll get an assembly, a list of the species or the taxa on the group of interest uh, that occur in your original sample. And you can build up a really nice profile or picture of diversity within whatever environmental matrix you're, you're looking at. Incredibly powerful. It's very involved. With digital PCR and quantitative PCR, it's recipaic. Uh, there, is, there are some tricks, obviously, to it. But by the end of it, you pretty well are there. Here, you get your results, and you still have a long row to hoe to actually get the data. So you have to be trained in bioinformatics. Yeah? You design them, actually. They're proprietary. So you just order them up from Illumina. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you can get like 200 unique identifiers and then you just ligate them onto the end or stick them onto the end. Yeah, anytime there's money to be made, you can be sure that one of these big companies is going to do it. So Illumina charges, like we, we bought some uh, uh, indices, indexes. I don't know what they call them anymore. Um, and I think it was three or $4,000 uh, order them up. But but we've been using them for five years, so they do last a long time. So that is a nutshell, and I'm happy to, to address questions. You're going to see those techniques in action in the lightning talks, I hope, if, if my students made it online. Um, and so you'll see how those can actually be applied to real world questions, even if some of the underlying molecular biology escapes you a little bit. After two beers, I find it all becomes really crystal clear, just saying. Uh, so I thought I'd put together some frequently asked questions. These might be self-evident to you, but I think it's useful anyway. So can environmental DNA be used to estimate abundance? This is a question we get asked all the time. Um, the short answer is maybe. Um, the problem is if you sample directly above a whale carcass, you're going to think that that's a whole pod of whatever whale species you're looking at. There's a lot of DNA. So there are complications there. But under certain circumstances with rigorous sampling, with rigorous validation for a particular system, it has been used in this way and it is being used in this way. And it may get sort of uh, better and better as, as more and more techniques come online. This will be self-evident perhaps, but does absence of eDNA signal mean a species is not present? Not necessarily. It is important that you undertake sort of rigorous quality control. So have lots of field controls and lots of lab controls. And it's important that you contemplate uh, sampling design in all of these things to try to mitigate some of the stuff I'm going to mention here. Um, in a lot of, if you sample in a bog, if you've ever fallen into a bog, you will know it has a lot of stuff in it. And a lot of those things like humic acid is an inhibitor of polymerase chain reaction. Um, so in many cases, you won't get a signal simply because there's an inhibitor there. Um, you can get competition so you can get competition from other DNA template, irrespective of the specificity of your primers. So if you have a shit ton, I use that phrase advisedly, of E. coli and, and, uh, and other microorganisms, there may be so much microorganismal DNA that you don't pick up your signal. Uh, it can be poor primer design. And as I said in the literature, you cannot accept as gospel truth that the primers in the literature are good. You test them yourselves. Uh, and it can be a phenological question. So it might simply be you're at the, uh, the uh, right place at the wrong time, that their life history is such that they're simply not there uh, contributing DNA into the matrix you're sampling at that time. Does a positive eDNA signal mean a species is currently present? Again, not necessarily. 
Um, you can have contamination. And I can't remember, but I think you spoke of contamination. And contamination is a real bugbear in environmental DNA studies. Uh, ideally, you have an ultra clean room, um, but that's not the case for most people. Um, you can get eDNA from previous occupancy. Um, so the animal might have been there if it's a migratory species, but it's no longer there. So you get a signal of an Eskimo curlew, um, which is a, a highly endangered, if not extinct species of, of shorebird. And it was there like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, and then um, we can get eDNA from another locale. So if you imagine sampling in a river, if you get a signal of some species here, then it may simply indicate that it's eDNA from way, way upstream that's flushed down. Um, and then finally, you might get a secondary signal. Um, for example, if a great blue heron eats a mink frog from this wetland, flies three wetlands over, poops in that wetland, then you'll pick up the signal of a mink frog and it's from the scat of the, the heron, not from a mink frog. So you have to take those kinds of considerations into account, yeah. Signal that's similar that doesn't differentiate a species, but you know it's similar to something else, or is it so unique that you wouldn't have a confusion over something similar? So, one of the things is if species are absent from the database when you do this big query, then you can pick up a species that is not in the database but is related to a species that is in the database. And in fact, you can use meta barcoding for species discovery. You can use this method. Craig Venter, do you know Craig Venter? He was one of the, the two leads on the Human Genome Project. He went the corporate way. And then Francis Collins went the, uh, the public good way. <laughs> and Craig Venter was big into bioprospecting. And the whole idea was to use uh, metabarcoding to discover new species. So you look for stuff that's related to other stuff, but has never been described. Yeah. So very quickly, some benefits of environmental DNA. It's non-invasive, so if you're studying a species at risk and you design a well-validated environmental DNA tool, and we're doing this for a whole host of species at risk, it's incredibly powerful. Um, it's useful for rare cryptic or elusive species. So if you're trying to do very broad scale, geographically intensive surveys, and you're trying to find something, a needle in a haystack, this might be uh, an interesting way to go. Uh, or if something is uh, incredible, like, uh, um, incredibly cryptic with respect to its life history, then you might be able to use this as a tool. You know, imagine Sicilians, for example, that you might not be able to easily detect, but maybe you could detect their eDNA presence. Um, it can simultaneously sample across a broad array of taxa. It doesn't require taxonomic sampling. There are, of course, powerful limitations to the approach. Environmental DNA is indirect, as I indicated. So an eDNA signal doesn't necessarily mean that the, the species is there. Um, so detection doesn't confirm presence of a species, although a well-designed assay should be very telling. Um, you might have, through contamination, false positives, and through inhibition, false negatives. The watch phrase here, or watch word, is controls, controls, controls. Design, design, design. If you do all of that well, then that mitigates a lot of the concern. It requires a complete database for the marker of interest. And so that's another big one. So in North America, we are... Uh, very well situated. But if you go, for example, to another part of the world um, where there's not a lot of molecular work that's been done, you may not be able to use this as readily, or at least metabarcoding as readily. Oops. I'm really messing this up. Oh, I can't. This minute. It's all right. It's me. I'm just fatigued. Uh, I just wanted to end with this. For the last three years, we've been teaching an environmental uh, DNA workshop at the Queen's University Biological Station. This is the uh, graduating class of 2024 on the deck of our, our main lodge at the Queen's University Biological Station. And I mention that because all of the folks up there have been working over these last three years to develop a manual for environmental DNA. So I've just skipped skipped a, a shiny stone, a shiny flat stone across the top of environmental DNA methods here. But if you're interested, you can use that QR code or just search it. Um, and this is freely available. And it sort of iteratively uh, allowed us to, to improve this. And it's a living document that we're gonna continue to work to, to improve. So we're intending to teach this again. And as we sort of gain new knowledge, we'll incorporate that into this.
um, as part of a, a big study that was led by Oriane Tourner, where she, uh, I, uh, we submitted the manuscript and I hubristically put in the title as How to Barcode, Barcode Almost All Aquatic Life. The reviewers did not like that. <laughs> yeah, they crapped on that from a giant height. Um, but it is published, uh, and, and there it is. And what Oriane did was to test 14 different primer pairs across a whole suite of taxa. Uh, and the idea was to try to categorize all of aquatic diversity, so plants, animals, microorganisms, to get a real picture of ecosystem health. Um, this is an app that my son created. It's also freely available, and it allows you to query that big data set and say, I want to look at turtles, or I want to look at frogs, or what have you, or any other data set that you might have, and choose the primer pairs that are best. Uh, we called it Snipe because I do bird watch, so... My daughter designed the logo. She's a graphics artist in Toronto. My partner gave me the name Snipe. So it's all four of us. I probably went over time. I haven't been looking at the, the, uh, uh, the time here. I should have been. What I would like to do is some rapid fire lightning talks with your leave. And these are hopefully four to five minute talks. Uh, these folks are at their stations in Quebec and, and Ontario. And we're hoping that Pam can pull them in, starting with Wen Shi Feng, who did a PhD with me uh, on turtles. And then we'll go through that list. So hi, guys. Uh, thanks for having, having me here. Uh, so I am a former PhD student at Mohi Lab. So today, I just very briefly share some of my, uh, our work I did during, during my PhD, uh, working on using environmental DNA to understand the distribution of freshwater turtles in Canada. So we all know that uh, freshwater turtles in North America uh, reach their northern range limits in Canada. So all of A species have a similar uh, distribution, but today we're going to focus on one specific turtle that Steve referred as stink pot turtles. Uh, order. So because, because of their uh, elusive uh, ecology, so it, there's a huge challenge to understand their distribution specifically in their northern range limits. So, so there is a potentially underestimated distribution of this turtle. So just quickly showing you what we did for this typical study. So on this map, on the left, uh, up left corner in the inset, you can see in a gray area, those are uh, documented area. And then uh, we look at map, uh, map on the left. So the red triangles are the observations that recorded in, in NHIC database. You can already see there's a disagreement, disagreement with this database and the documented range. And then the red uh, the red dots on the left is where I where we took environment DNA samples across this region, specifically trying to uh, cover the area uh, in, in this area that we don't we really have any uh, knowledge. And also we took five samples along the Gatineau River, uh, way north of of their out of their distribution as a uh, sort of negative control. On, and then on, on the right side, we can uh, briefly show you here the results where the red dots are where we did not detect any DNA, DNA signals using the quantitative PCR methods for mass turtle. And the red dots are where we had detection. So we can already see that uh, in the area that we do not have any documentation of this turtle, we have eDNA signals. So with the database that from NHIC observations and also our eDNA detections, we are uh, good to do some niche modeling to map their distribution uh, using specifically here, in this case, mass entropy or max in short algorithm. So in short, niche modeling is model that is a statistical model that relates species occurrence across the landscape with environmental uh, variables. So in particular, this estimate, uh, this algorithm maxn takes presence only data, uh, occurrence data and whatever variable layers that we input into the model. In this case, we input 40 different variables into the model and try to optimize the model. And then in the end, the algorithm outputs a probability distribution of presence that contains the most information, that's the name max entropy, that was given by the environmental constraints, uh, which was the environmental variable, the variables. Just very quickly show you guys the results. So this is the results from the NHIC and, and eDNA data combined model in the entire Southern Ontario, which actually include the entire range of uh, common mass turtle in Canada. So uh, without looking into details of all the six, uh, six little graphs, so I categorized this top six uh, variables in two, into two, two categories, 
uh, in the red color, uh, I, I refer this as threshold variables, where if you have uh, temperature in a, a, a mean temperature of the warmest quarter in, in the summer over 17 degrees, a mean temperature, annual mean temperature over 40 degrees, uh, sorry, lower than 40 degrees elevation. So all, all these uh, variables on, on, in the red, they are, they, they are the, the kind of the constraints. If, you, if, you, if the environment in, does not meet this requirement, the turtle will not uh, be appearing here. And then, then we have the other two variables where we categorize as optimal variables, where uh, if you have optimal range, where you have around, if, if you have a vicinity of approximately comprised of 50% water body and 15% of shoreline area, then there's an optimal uh, habitat for the turtles. So to summarize, very quickly summarize what we did here. Uh, so environment DNA can be an effective tool to serve a cryptic uh, reptiles such as sinkfire turtles. And the distribution of this turtle in Southern Ontario is potentially underestimated. And we need further validation of this, uh, either using more, more environment DNA surveys or uh, actual uh, uh, visual surveys, traditional surveys based on environment DNA detection. And finally, the northern range limits of sinkfire turtles is, is shaped by uh, various factors, including thermal conditions, pre precipitation regimes, elevation uh, features, and, and aquatic features, and all this as partially is actually discovered by the combination of traditional knowledge of the turtle by observation, as well as environment DNA detections. So all this is very brief about one of the study, one of the chapters in my PhD study, and this work has been published in PRGN, and there's a barcode if you guys want, are interested, you can scan uh, to get access. Next, so I'll pass on to the next speaker, Madeline. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Madeline and I'm going to be talking about another case study uh, of the use of environmental DNA for studying Kerpidafana. So when she has just told us a really interesting example of species distributions, and I think this statement um, is a statement that everyone here can agree with, that as ecologists and biologists, we are interested in the geographic distribution of a species or a population. Um, this example is a genus of fire-bellied toads, which shows a very interesting distribution. But saying that we're interested in the distribution of a species is sometimes not as easy as it seems on the surface. We might have a case where two species look very similar and behave in a very similar way, but actually have genetic signatures that are deeply diverged. So just because they look the same doesn't mean that their genes are telling us the same story. And this is the case with the Western chorus frog. Some of you uh, in the room will be very familiar with the story of the so-called Western chorus frog, which is classified as one species, but actually has mitochondrial signatures uh, reflective of two very distinct mitochondrial lineages. In Ontario and Quebec, there are two mitochondrial lineages that have over 10% sequence divergence with respect to cytochrome B, which is a huge amount of diversity. I'm not going to get too into the details here, but the contact zone of these two lineages is something that has historically been uh, a little bit confusing and complex, uh, with different studies placing the contact zone at different locations. But a problem that arose is that there was incomplete geographic sampling effort um, so there were areas that we didn't have a lot of information about, and at each given location, we might only have one or a few individuals, which doesn't tell us um, the genetic signature of the whole breeding assemblage. So this is some of the background information that really shaped my master's work, which was to map the contact zone of these two mitochondrial lineages in Ontario. And we used environmental DNA for this study. This was advantageous because it meant that we were really able to ramp up sampling effort and get a really good uh, geographic scope. Also, uh, using eDNA means that we have a better representation of the whole assemblage. When we hand capture frogs, we're usually only catching males because they're the ones that are vocalizing. And if we catch females, it's incident incidental and very rare. As Steve talked about, using eDNA can also facilitate the study of rare or cryptic species. Sampling is also not restricted to the breeding season when we use eDNA. So I was able to sample outside of the breeding season. And as you can see from these pictures, I'm sampling during the daytime, which is a huge win if you're a frog person, because it means that you don't have to be up until 1 or 2 a.m. Uh, sampling uh, your populations. 
So these are some results uh, from my work and from uh, Ying Chen's work, who is a co-author on this project. On the left, we have our eDNA results, and on the right are the tissue results. In both of these maps, this area here is Toronto, so Lake Ontario, and then up north we have Georgian Bay. And in both of these maps, red represents areas where we detected Zyracris triseriata, yellow represents areas where we detected Zyracris maculata, and orange represents areas where we detected both. Really what I want you to take away from this is that environmental DNA results and tissue samples showed a very similar overall trend. So this does give us uh, some confidence in interpreting our environmental DNA results because it has been substantiated by tissue samples. Also, I do want to point out that there were a few locations where uh, tissue samples revealed only one lineage, whereas environmental DNA revealed both lineages, which is really exciting and just highlights the power of using eDNA for this type of study to be able to detect rare species or lineages. So a few take home messages, eDNA is really uh, useful if we are interested in mapping uh, a geographic area, and it sometimes even performs better than tissue samples when we are trying to detect a rare lineage. As Steve talked about, um, using eDNA can be important when we're studying species at risk because we always want to minimize the harm uh, to those organisms and to those populations. So this is just one example of how environmental DNA can be a very useful tool uh, when studying herpetofauna. So I'll be presenting on a third application of environmental DNA, assessing the breeding phenology of a cryptic amphibian species using environmental DNA, and then validating that and comparing it to acoustic monitoring, which is more traditional. So as herpetologists, all of us know that climate change can drive life history shifts. Earlier ice off times, warmer winters can cause phenological mismatches and reduce amphibian fitness. For example, earlier ice off and warmer early spring can cause amphibians to come out and call too early, uh, reducing fitness due to a lack of food or other unfavorable environmental conditions. And for conservation best practice, for knowing when to put moratoriums on things like construction and noise, we need data of high spatial and temporal specificity on life history. And how are these phenology, uh, phenological shifts happening? A lot of amphibians are too cryptic for intensive observation, especially non-vocal salamanders and Sicilians. And environmental DNA is a promising method for non-intrusive monitoring. So instead of taking tissue samples, or hunting down these frogs and salamanders, we can just take water samples. So in this study, we designed and evaluated eDNA DDPCR assays for the Western chorus frog. Uh, and to validate our assay, we compared our eDNA detections to automatic acoustic monitoring. So we went to a marsh at the Queen's University Biological Station, Roundfield, set up three acoustic monitoring stations and collected DNA from nine sites every two days for over the course of um, one month in 2022. Uh, at the start, uh, before the breeding season and at the start of the breeding season. Uh, we tested methods to reduce inhibition, which is a common problem in black water and wetland samples with eDNA, um, diluting our samples using a cleanup kit and using bovine serum albumin, which is a common method in improving PCR conditions. So we validated our assay, um, like Steve mentioned. So we tested if it actually worked. So our, fro our lab does a lot of work on frogs. So we had tissue samples from all frogs that are in Ontario. So we tested if our assay actually worked on the Western chorus frog, and just as importantly, that it didn't work on other frogs in Ontario. We also optimize assay sensitivity through changing parameters like annealing temperature. And here are our results. Um, so the top graph over here shows our acoustic monitoring results in the red triangles, as well as our eDNA results in the dashes and stars. So calling first began on March 31st, First, and our first eDNA detection was on April 6th. This was a lag of six days. And in the middle graph, we monitored uh, air temperature and water temperature. Note that our first eDNA detection corresponds to when water temperature consistently reached over freezing. So before that, um, the frogs might have been just sitting on the ice calling. Uh, we did have a non-detection later in the breeding season on April 8th, but that corresponded to a rain event, as we see in the bottom graph in gray, which might have diluted the DNA or stirred up inhibitors. So we detected inhibition in our samples, and um, over half, uh, almost half our samples had inhibitors. 
And we detected this using an internal positive control. So this is just an assay of a non-related species that we know that isn't present. Um, so we use this assay on our samples. And then if there's a difference between our samples and our negative controls, then we know there's inhibition. We tested literature methods uh, to mitigate this inhibition and both bovine serum albumin and cleaning up this, uh, this DNA was ineffective and re or resulted in sample loss, likely due to the low concentration of our DNA. Diluting the sample, so from like 100 copies to 10 copies of one to 10 dilution uh, did reduce inhibition. And because digital PCR is so sensitive, this let us get a little better results. So overall, environmental DNA signal lagged behind by several days due to ice cover or low concentration, but can occur of minimum calling. So we can detect a single copy of DNA in a bottle of water, and um, this allows us to detect phenology really early. So it is suitable for monitoring non-calling species phenology. Acoustic monitoring, though, is still preferable for earliest detection, especially if you have the resources to set up acoustic um, recorders. Um, sampling, if you're trying to do extensive presence serving instead of phenology, sampling should occur after egg laying. Um, so samples that we took in May after egg laying occurred had DNA concentrations that were something like 100 times higher. Uh, in inhibition will be an issue and will always be an issue in eDNA. Uh, so internal positive control should be used. Um, however, we did have very significant results, so it's still a suitable tool for characterizing phenology of amphibians. All right, uh, so let's move on to detection predation now, uh, using environmental DNA with the case study of turkey predation of bruiser. So quantifying diet can be challenging because the prey are rare or the predation events seldom seen because of foraging times or places, seasonal shift, cryptic species, and it may involve invasive methods with the capture of the individual and, for example, taking out the stomach to see what is inside. And the food items may not even be identified because just based on the morphology of degraded body parts, it can be hard to go beyond family or older um, identification level. But so why do we care about Turkey in a herb conference? Well, the wild turkeys have been reintroduced to Ontario and they're generalists, meaning that they eat a little bit of everything, including small snakes, salamanders, and frogs. So the question was, on Pili Island, where the blue racer is endangered and facing many threats, is the, are the turkeys preying on blue racer, adding a new threat to their already endangered population? And for that, to answer that question, we designed and validated a new species-specific DNA assay, both in silico, using all the reference sequences that Steve mentioned in public reference databases, and in vitro using the DNA extracting, extracted from tissue. We used the droplet digital PCR, and we especially focused on the specificity of the assay, meaning we want it to amplify only the blue racer, and the sensitivity, and without going too much into the details of this matrix, we looked at the limit of detection uh, and the limit of quantification. So what's the lowest concentration that can be detected and the lowest concentration that can be accurately quantified um, in the samples? And you have all the details in the manual. And as Christina mentioned earlier, Controls are very important. So we use all the type of control you can use, positive control, blue racer DNA, negative and no template con uh, controls to check for contaminations. And once all of this was done, we tested the assay against five crop samples and eight FICO samples that were collected on Pili Island. And so let's see our results. We were very happy because the assay was highly specific, meaning it did not amplify any of the co-occurring snake species we, we tested. You have uh, on this figure, on the y-axis, the fluorescence, uh, with in blue, the positive droplets, so the, showing the presence of the DNA in the droplets, and in gray, the negative droplets. And the x-axis is just showing you the controls, NTC, the positive controls, so the blue racer, and all the co-occurring snake species sample. And what you can see is that only the blue racer got positive droplets. So very good. Then um, the assay was highly sensitive, meaning that we had very low limit of detection and limit of quantification. So great, that's validated. Um, but we got inconclusive results in the crops and fecal samples. 
So that's the same DDPCR output, um, but this time you still have the negative control, the positive control, and then you have the turkey fecal samples, um, and we didn't detect anything, which is good for the blue racer. But in conclusion, um, the we. We need uh, the assay to be robustly validated, so we have to follow many steps uh, and check all uh, the boxes. So it takes time, it takes money, but it's absolutely necessary if you want to be able to trust your results. We did not detect uh, EGNA signal in crops and fecal samples, but it is not a proof that white turkey don't prey on the blue racers, as to mentioned earlier, there are many reasons that could affect that. So many more fecal samples at strategic location during snake kick activity would provide a more statistically robust test. And finally, it opens up new application uh, for investigate, investigating all the factors affecting the blue racers. So for example, by collecting water, soil, or even air sample, we could help quantifying blue racer habitat suitability and site occupancy. I just said to the assembled throng here that uh, Oriana is doing a second postdoc and she's using air samples to actually quantify diversity. So she's using eDNA, but it's not from water, it's not from soil, it's actually from air, which is a really cool and exciting application that's a uh, filter, vacuum. No, no, you don't go out and <laughs> you, you and I can go out and sample by the airport later on. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I there are little uh, devices that can actually pull the air through. And so you get all the DNA and particulates that adhere to the... So it's in principle, it's like a peristaltic pump. So you're just getting the DNA on the filters. Yeah. Follow up on that, maybe it's true. So is it basically like storing little balloons? You know, you put the water through like a little filter and then you have your little sample. So are they, is she basically storing like a bunch of tiny balloons in the freezer or does it have a life like that? No, I mean, you, you can store it in C-Tab or some other buffer, just like you can aquatic, but it's on a filter. Yeah. We, we don't do it in our lab yet, but. So this is the last you'll hear from me. This is another lightning talk, and uh, it is uh, the first chapter of what I hope will be three or four wonderful chapters from PhD candidate Stafford Maracle. Um, and he's using sort of molecular ecology eDNA techniques to sample fish diversity. Forgive my taxonomic uh, transgression here. Um, but he's also incorporating indigenous perspectives into ecosystem health. And so he's sort of combining the two, two pieces in his PhD. I'm not going to speak to the indigenous piece. That's his ballywick, but I am going to speak to the DNA beta barcoding. So you will know in... And, and remember, I just found out I'm giving this talk not too long ago. Um, in big uh, systems, big ecosystems, um, gaining perspectives on sort of uh, environmental quality or uh, assemblages species across their length is really challenging. So eDNA, as I've already indicated, can help us to address monitoring gaps within such large and diverse ecosystems. And if you think of the St. Lawrence River, uh, there are almost 200 aquatic invasive species with a whole bunch coming on stream now. We just had an alert that there's a new species that's going to be coming in. We're doing some eDNA work that's tracking the tench, which is another Eurasian invader. Uh, and it's coming down from Quebec, predictably a fish farm where it got out. Um, so large river systems like the St. Lawrence, where 20% of the fresh water of the world flows through or it drains that that system. So it's an immense system. It's really difficult to monitor. Physically large, there are a lot of different assaults on this system, lots of varying habitat and communities. And this, if you use traditional methods, requires an, an awful lot of taxonomic expertise. Um, so the St. Lawrence River has over 80 fish species that have been documented. And um, Habitats vary quite dramatically with respect to levels of human impact. And in the area where we are, which is a World Biosphere Reserve, the Frontenac Arch World Biosphere Reserve, there still are relatively intact parts of the St. Lawrence River and then heinously impacted parts of the river where there used to be pulp and paper plants and such like that. And so what that means is different parts of the river, different stretches of the river have different impacts. Um, 
And currently, much of the fish monitoring, at least, relies on uh, netting, mostly seine netting, and some electrofishing. And those were the data. And these data are rich and important. But we wanted to see if eDNA metabarcoding, remember, this is the method where we can simultaneously survey uh, diversity of an entire group, in this case, all fish. Can it provide a more robust assessment of fish diversity than these traditional methods? One thing I want to say is, because I am at heart a gumboot biologist, is this doesn't replace these methods. It becomes a powerful complement to these methods. So that's one thing I do want to emphasize. Um, and ultimately, can we detect using environmental DNA these human impacts, at least in the riparian human impact? We're not talking about uh, underwater or anything like that. And so this is really the heart of one of the data chapters for Stafford, and it is published in the Journal of Great Lakes Research. Um, this is a partnership, I should say, with uh, Aquasasne, which is a Mohawk First Nation very near Cornwall. It is in partnership with the River Institute, which is a wonderful NGO which, with, uh, with whom we uh, uh, have developed many grants and projects together. Um, and so part of this is, is a, a program for over the, uh, I don't know, last five, six, seven years has been seining up and down the St. Lawrence River from Quebec all the way down to uh, the Bay of Quinte or near Kingston, Ontario. And so these are 48 different uh, sites that were sampled near shore in the upper St. Lawrence River. And so we have water samples and simultaneously we have seining data from these very same sites. Uh, we seined after we sampled water, just so you know. That's the proper order. Yeah. Um, and so you can just see the, uh, the uh, samples there. So there we have the Quebec, so downstream Kingston right there. You can see Gord Downey smiling. There's the Bay of Quinte. And so we used a, a MyFish marker, which is a universal for fish, 12S uh, metabarcoding marker that some of you may have seen. I don't know. So here we have just a summary here. We have seine netting. Uh, shown on the left. Notice I say public domain, got that from Wiki. And that's a picture of uh, Wen Shi, who's out sampling a lake at the Queen's University Biological Station. Um, there's the paper, should you be interested. And so I'm actually going to cut to the chase. I'm not going to go through any of the, the uh, hoary details of lab work or, or bioinformatics. So we already have the data in hand. Isn't it exciting? There's a lot of work that went into this. So this is a, a species accumulation curve. On the y-axis, we have number of species detected. And then essentially on the x-axis, it's like a, a, a rarefaction uh, approach. We have the number of, of water samples or number of sites. And so you have seining data, you have eDNA data. How many species do we accumulate as we accrete? sites. And what you can see here quite clearly is that this purple is the seining data and that green is the uh, eDNA data. And so with eDNA, we detected almost as tw uh, twice the number of species and we detected a lot more species at risk and a lot more invasive species than we did with uh, the uh, traditional seine netting. And part of that is not the fault of seining. It's that with water, you're sort of integrating a much broader volume or a much broader area, but you're also detecting species that might be uh, benthic or that are slipping through the, the nets. And so you're getting a more complete picture potentially if you do it right. And so here's an analysis that uh, looks at impacts. So this is human impact. So what we did is we divided uh, the, the sampling sites according to their shoreline, uh, how impacted the shorelines are. So this is highly impacted. You can imagine an urban area like maybe around the, the town of Brockville or city of Brockville, moderately impacted and natural shorelines. So falling into a category where we might say it's, it's rel not, if not pristine, at least there's intact forest and repairing corridor. And so what we have is uh, species richness on the y-axis, these three categories, we have eDNA compared to seining data. No significant difference using the seining, seining data, but we did find a significant difference between the natural shoreline fish assemblages and the highly impacted. So we get a signature of human impacts using eDNA that we don't pick up using the seining data. So it's really nice demonstration of how, if deployed well, you can answer some interesting questions and maybe even get some really, truly powerful data using metabarcoding. So does eDNA provide higher species resolution or detection? Yes, it seems to. Not always. I want to emphasize this is one study, but it's a well-done study. Um, 
Can it detect rare, invasive, and otherwise elusive species? Overall, we had a higher detection rate of these rare and invasive species. And uh, in fact, for example, I mentioned the tench, this up and coming invasive species that probably has already hit Lake Ontario, unfortunately. So, um, and uh, we detected it, I think, 150 or 100 kilometers further upstream than had the traditional surveys as yet. So, um, and finally, eDNA and human impacts, did it provide uh, a different picture than the traditional staining data? Yes, it did. Uh, species richness was reduced with impacted riparian zones, and this was shown with the eDNA data and not with the uh, staining data.